It's December 14th, 2008, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. As he stood up just a few metres from George W. Bush on this day in 2008, the journalist Muntada al-Zaidi shouted in Arabic, This is a gift from the Iraqis. This is the farewell kiss, you dog, and hurled his shoe at the US president's head. Bush ducked as Zaidi... Well, I guess reloaded or something with his second shoe, <laughs> with which he also missed. But in the act, at least, of throwing these shoes at George W. Bush, he became a cult hero throughout the Arab world. And I have to say, not, I mean, not to come in on a pro George W. Bush wing on this story, but he handles the incident pretty coolly. It'd been a long time <laughs> since I'd seen this video, but he sort of ducks and then he's, you can almost see him smirk like yes. he's pleased with himself. Yeah, he's got his George W. smile He on. knows that it's an incident. He yeah. knows that he's on camera. I mean, bear in mind, this was the president who was on camera being told about 9-11 whilst at a primary school. So he'd been stung by, you know, video footage previously, hadn't he? I think yeah. he knows immediately, oh, OK, this is going to be on the internet, so let's react. Part of it is almost like he's got this weird jock thing going on where he's, yes. I think he's pleased with himself that he's ducked the shoes so effectively. <laughs> if I were the US president and I saw some object flying towards me at a press conference <laughs> in occupied Iraq, I would be absolutely bricking it. Yeah, you, you're right. And also, I know Bush doesn't speak Arabic. But I mean, the second one is delivered with real venom, even though this is a sort of novelty thing to do. He says, this is from the widows, the orphans and those who were killed in Iraq. But yeah, Bush, Jock is right. That is exactly yeah. the expression. Like, he ducks it brilliantly both times and then he makes a joke out of it in a sort of Tony Blair-esque way, like slickly deals with it. Yeah, or quite like that moment where Obama swatted a fly. The fly, yeah. In the middle and he just looks so pleased with himself. Just like, yes. I am president, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look at my physical capacity <laughs> yeah. kind of way. I don't know what's changed in the intervening years either, but I just feel like the whole incident would be taken in a far more sort of sombre, po-faced way now. Like even immediately afterwards, a reporter asked Bush about it and his response was, all he said was, it's a way for people to draw attention. I don't know what the guy's cause was. I didn't feel the least bit threatened by it. You know, he didn't try and turn it into a drama and I feel like now it would be turned into a huge drama. mm mm-hmm. I mean, he'd been in politics a long time by this point. This was his, as he would see it, victory lap, wasn't it? It was his last chance to go to Iraq as president of the United States. And he had a mission there. You know, there was some serious propaganda they wanted to get done. Maybe he just didn't want this shoe incident to be the thing. Later on that day, he went to give a speech at Al Four Palace where he called the increased deployment of American troops in Iraq the year before one of the greatest successes in the history of the United States military. That's what he was there to say. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it had this sort of mission accomplished again kind of overtone <laughs> that he was like, no, 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 we really did do something good here, even though by this stage he must have known that things weren't looking good. But Zaidi himself, he was really broadly praised all around the the Arab world, at, at least, as this kind of David versus Goliath figure. And thousands of protesters immediately demanded his release because obviously he was taken into custody immediately. And lawyers worldwide then uh, volunteered to represent him pro bono. He also received various offers of marriage and a Saudi Arabian television station reported that a Saudi businessman had said that he was willing to pay $10 million uh, for one of the famous shoes, though uh, unfortunately the shoes had both been destroyed after they were checked for explosives, so they they don't exist anymore. And also because the Americans would not want those shoes exactly ending up as that kind of prize would they? Oh, exactly. so again yeah. like they may have shrugged For it off symbolic quality but they obviously yeah. thought it was a big enough deal that those like let's destroy these because we don't want them ending up in a, an anti-george bush museum exactly and also shoes became this symbol for defiance around iraq with you know people in baghdad neighborhoods apparently parading their shoes on long poles and waving them in the air so the symbolism of the shoe was something that the americans were right to jump on But none of this actually ended up helping Zaidi in any way because he said that basically all these extravagant offers that were made to him kind of just sort of quietly went away after the initial wave of enthusiasm. I mean, the Emir of Qatar promised him a golden horse. I don't know whether that is an actual type of horse (laughs) or whether that is a horse made of gold. I mean, either would be a nice present. (laughs) 
And, you know, that was one of the offers that was rescinded, probably because the US and Qatar are a major ally. So, it was, you know, it's a lot of these, I think, were cases of Arab leaders jockeying to get on board this pro Zaidi movement, but then all the support dried up. And Zaidi was kind of left by himself. He ended up being charged with insulting a foreign head of state on an official visit. And he was facing up to three years in jail under the Iraqi judicial system. He said that he was tortured in custody. And it's kind of sad, really, that he did become this folk hero for so many people. But in his own country, it sounds like he was pretty poorly treated. Yeah, I mean, to clarify the torture, he said he was beaten with iron bars, that he was administered electric shocks, that he was left soaked in cold water overnight. And that matters because one of the things that Bush said was, aha, this is what happens in a democracy, isn't it? This is freedom of speech. A journalist can say what they really think. That wouldn't have happened under Saddam Hussein. But actually, he Mm. was dragged away and beaten. And he had actually been kidnapped a year before off the streets of Baghdad on his way to work as journalist. And the, his captors, who never revealed their identities, they quizzed him about his work and he was beaten by them. And then he was sort of released onto the street. And I think that may have acted in a way as a final straw because a lot of his work up to this point had been doing this quite, you know, gruelling reportage on the effects of the US occupation, you know, airstrikes, bombings, etc., talking with victims. And that had really given him this sort of passionate feeling that, that something terrible was happening to the country. And I I think being kidnapped in his own country as well just added to this sense for him that he absolutely had to make this big gesture. And even after he got out of prison, having suffered all of that torture, apparently he was missing one of his front teeth when he got out. But even after all of that, he said he had absolutely no regrets. And in an op-ed published in The Guardian shortly after he got out, he said of his reporting in Iraq, and I quote, As soon as I finished my professional duties in reporting the daily tragedies, while I washed away the remains of the debris of the ruined Iraqi houses or the blood that stained my clothes, I would clench my teeth and make a pledge to our victims, a pledge of vengeance. So, you know, he was always thinking in the back of his mind that even though he was working as a journalist about how he could do his bit to get a bit back on behalf of Iraq, I guess, towards America. It does show as well, doesn't it, what a visual culture we are, that it is one of the images you associate with the war. Mm. The other one, probably the bigger one, is the felling of Saddam's statue. Mm. Um, I know that was one of hundreds of Saddam statues actually and you could see it as western propaganda that that's the image we all saw but nonetheless it's a visual image that strikes you from that time also involving Arabs throwing shoes at things but this one is so redolent of that period that actually I'd conflated it in my head and thought that it had happened at the end of the war you know at the end of uh, Mm. Operation Iraqi Freedom as they called it but it didn't it happened six years later six years and zero weapons of mass destruction found later um it was such a strong moment yeah and it has sparked copycat incidents across the world in iraq itself people use their shoes to slap posters of Saddam hussein but it also went further people who have been targets include um tony blair the former australian prime minister john howard and a weird one justin bieber who was targeted by an angry concert goer in stockholm when he refused to sing despacito on the grounds that he didn't actually speak spanish (laughs) <laughs> right that deserves a shoeing yeah a shoe in yeah. the face <laughs> richly deserved shoeing is the verb by the way isn't it i think that's just <laughs> such a funny <laughs> to, word to be shooed yeah to shoe i've seen the list <laughs> lists of political shoeings it's a thing and one victim of shoeings ended up to be Zaidi himself. No. In 2009, yeah, he was speaking at a news conference in Paris and an Iraqi this man This is for the all audience. the cobblers that you denigrated. <laughs> Shoes are meant to be worn on your feet. Well, not that, but he accused him of supporting dictatorship in general and flung his shoe at him. And afterwards, Zaidi joked, he stole my technique. So even he had a bit of the W's about him in the, his response to the incident. And you know what happened? After this guy threw the shoe, Al Zaidi's brother, who was with him, chased the assailant and threw his own shoe at him. So <laughs> shoes were flying all over the place at this point. I do think the cultural significance of it gets a bit overstated sometimes because, I mean, in the Arab world, showing the underside of the shoe is considered to be very offensive because it's, you know, it makes contact with the ground. Yeah. That's one reason why a Muslim wouldn't enter a mosque and keep their shoes on, for instance. Right. Uh-huh. But at the same time, it's really quite a universal gesture, right? If someone takes off their shoe and throws it at you, you're not going to be under the mistaken impression that it's like some kind of cultural (laughs) sign of hospitality. Yes, and actually it's also universal in the sense that almost everyone has shoes and can do it. Yeah. So it's it's like once you've you've, uh, weaponised that you, and you can't really s- stop people walking into events with... It's as if, like, they were, you know, people were using their pens. 
Like there yeah. comes a point where always, it's a press conference, people have got shoes on. There's nothing we can do about that. I always wondered that about the cliche of bad theatrical performances where the performer yeah. has fruit and vegetables thrown at mm. them. And I was like, well, who goes to the show with fruit and right. veg just in case it sucks and then you can throw stuff yeah, at Yeah, if it was them. ice cream lids, you'd believe it. But then it's a big deal to throw a shoe because you might not get it back. It's like people used to throw their knickers at Tom Jones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whereas you need your shoe to get out of the place. Tomorrow. Dig me up at the request of an author, take my body across three different boats, parade me around Paris, and then inter me not by the banks of the Seine. <laughs> Love the show? Support the show. Patreon.com slash retrospectors. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.